Good morning and welcome to CSIS. Good afternoon if you're not in the Eastern time zone. Um, we are going to do a launch of our report, Evolving Cyber Operations and Capabilities, that was done uh, with the sponsorship of the National Cybersecurity Center in the UK and with four uh, very strong authors. Uh, I'm going to introduce them by reading their titles, then we'll talk briefly. Um, Paul Chichester is currently the Director of Operations at the UK's National Cyber Center. Uh, Erica Lonergan is Assistant Professor at the Army Cyber Institute. Melanie Garson is the Cyber Policy Lead and Acting Director of, the, of Geopolitics at the Tony Blair Institute. Uh, Amy, <clears throat> pardon me, Amy Ertan is a visiting scholar at NATO's CCDCOE. I always, always get that title wrong and Data Protection Fellow at the Institutes for Technology and Society. Uh, Julia View is a Cyber Fellow at Harvard University. We will have uh, their full bios, which are very impressive, uh, both in the publication, which there should be a link to now, and also on our website. So the order will be uh, that um, we'll have Erica, Amy, Melanie, and Julia each give a uh, five, six minute overview of their their chapter. Uh, we'll then have Paul give concluding remarks. Pardon me, we'll then have David give, no, Paul give concluding remarks. And um, then we'll go into a moderated discussion. So with that, let me ask uh, uh, Erica, if you could begin for us. Great, thanks, Jim. Um, thanks to CSIS and the NCSC for putting this all together, um, and to my colleagues also for their great contributions. Um, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about um, cyber proxy warfare in Ukraine. Um, and uh, I guess what drew me to this topic was that I was really struck by kind of the mismatch between all of the commentary uh, and kind of the expectations of policymakers in the lead up to the conflict about what the cyber dimension of the war would look like and then what actually has materialized. And um, as we all know now, you know, there is a lot of focus on cyber shock and awe on sort of Russian advanced persistent threat actors conducting um, high-end cyber attacks, either on the battlefield in Ukraine or potentially even against uh, targets in the West. Um, we sort of know now that that really hasn't come to pass in the way that a lot of people expected. Um, but that doesn't mean that there hasn't been some really interesting cyber activity that's taken place both in Ukraine and beyond. Um, and from my perspective, <coughs> apologies, um, what, what I think is really interesting about this is the sort of new permutations of cyber proxy warfare, which is sort of an old and longstanding um, form of, of cyber warfare. Um, we've seen a real surge in hacktivist groups with these sort of nebulous relationships to um, government actors conducting these noisy, disruptive cyber attacks that don't actually have meaningful effects, but that serve as tools of sort of political mobilization. Um, so it's it's more sort of a form of political warfare than it is sort of cyber warfare as we may traditionally think about it. Um, so what I'll do is sort of briefly talk about kind of traditional models of cyber proxy warfare. Um, I'll talk a bit about what we've seen in Ukraine, especially um, with Kilnet on the Russian aligned side and the IT Army of Ukraine on the uh, Ukrainian aligned side, and then kind of offer some suggestions for what I think this means for the future of um, cyber and conflict. Um, so proxy warfare obviously is not a new concept either in cyberspace or um, in other domains of conflict. Great powers have been waging war by proxy um, as a way of avoiding direct interaction for many, many decades. Um, and they have you know carried this over into the digital domain. Um, you know, traditionally, um, or when we think about sort of traditional forms of cyber proxy warfare, we typically see sort of states form these ambiguous relationships that are plausibly deniable with non-state actors who may be witting or unwitting, um, and then these groups operate on their behalf. Um, and Russia has been a pretty prolific actor in the space, as we all know. Um, it mobilized cyber proxies um, in conjunction with its um, invasion of Georgia, in 2008, um, its annexation of Crimea in 2014. Um, it tacitly permits cyber criminal groups to operate from its territory, some of whom have been responsible for a recent spate of ransomware attacks against Western targets and so on. And this type of proxy warfare isn't going anywhere anytime soon. We've seen this manifest in the current Ukraine conflict. There have been a number of um, 
uh, cyber proxy activity um, in, in Ukraine to target um, Ukraine's critical infrastructure to try to disrupt it, particularly the power sector. So we, we see sort of this dimension um, of cyber proxy conflict in the war. Uh, but we've also seen a whole lot more of sort of other forms of cyber activity that's much more focused on sort of political warfare and information warfare than it's actually focused on causing meaningful cyber effects, either sort of in conjunction with battlefield operations or, um, you know, as a form of coercion. Um, and it's also different from how we um, <clears throat> might typically think about cyber enabled information warfare, because the focus is less on sort of shaping on, on having cognitive effects in a target audience. Like, for example, Russia's 2016 cyber enabled information operations against the US election, right? The target was the US um, were audiences in the United States. Here, what we're seeing in Ukraine is, um, you know, um, cyber enabled political or information warfare as a way of mobilizing social and political constituencies within the group itself and within sympathetic audiences. So it's sort of a different um, different sort of target audience set. Um, and so really briefly, let me talk about KillNet and the IT Armory of Ukraine, because I think they're the most prolific and interesting examples of this. Um, KillNet is a Russian aligned hacktivist group. It began as this obscure botnet for hire and then kind of rebranded itself as a hacktivist group in the early days of the conflict. Um, and it's distinguished itself from other Russian aligned proxy groups by conducting cyber attacks outside of the theater of operations in Ukraine, particularly against Western targets, particularly against NATO's eastern flank, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. Um, and Kilnet really relishes in this kind of blustery, hyperbolic language to talk about its cyber attacks. It's prolific on um, social media, especially its Russian language telegram channel. It's plugged into sort of Russia's broader pro-war propaganda culture. It has these like collabs with jewelry makers and rappers. And, and so it, it's part of this broader political and kind of information narrative. Um, it disavows a formal relationship with the Russian government, but it's clear that it's serving Russia's broader interests. Um, it's sort of a useful tool of um, the Russian government's efforts to maintain domestic support for the war and kind of rally that sort of domestic constituency. That's the Russian side. Uh, really briefly on the Ukraine side, um, there are also cyber proxy groups aligned with Ukraine. The most notable of these is the IT Army of Ukraine. Um, the group was created by um, Ukraine's deputy prime minister and minister of digital transformation in the beginning of the war. Um, it may have a more formal relationship with the government, but that's not entirely clear based on publicly available research. Um, and, and unlike Kilnet, the IT Army of Ukraine is a bit more organized um, in its mobilization of social media. It maintains a very active and robust social media presence. Um, it has prioritized sort of target lists. It seems to deconflict across different lines of effort. It has a tasking process on its Telegram channel. It has sort of themes around different types of cyber attacks. But similar to Killnet, the impact of these attacks is pretty negligible, right? It's these um, sort of low cost, disruptive, DDoS attacks against different types of targets that aren't really doing much to sort of shape, have a meaningful effect from, uh, from a cyber perspective. Instead, it's like Killnet, this kind of um, social and political tool of mobilization, um, both adherence within Ukraine and also sort of broader um, um, in, in international community. Um, so in terms of policy implications, I think there's just a few that I want to highlight. One is that... Um, kind of going back to the beginning of my remarks, we've been really focused on um, sort of the cyber shock and awe, the strategic use of cyberspace um, as a tool of coercion or on the battlefield. And, and it's not to say that that's not meaningful, but what we're seeing here is this other use of cyberspace for political warfare. It's a lot more ambiguous. It's hard to regulate. It poses far more challenges for policymakers, but it's clearly something that we need to be anticipating about the future of conflict. Um, another important implication is that I think we need to be careful about playing into these groups' hands. Um, you can look on Killnet's Telegram channel, and they actually, um, they're highly attuned to how they are perceived and talked about in Western media and policy circles. And so kind of uh, using hyperbolic language plays into their hands and sort of further gives them political credence in a way that ultimately undermines Western political objectives. Um, and then finally, I think there's some interesting implications on the defense and resilience side. Um, 
there was reporting recently that the Ukrainian government is trying to figure out how it can formalize the IT army and actually incorporate it into its cyber defense, uh, which the regular forces. Um, and so I think, you know, particularly sort of smaller countries with less mature, less well-resourced military cyber organizations may want to be paying close attention to like how this process works, whether Ukraine's able to effectively transition sort of these amorphous volunteers into something more formalized um, and maybe compare to other sort of volunteer models like Estonia Cyber Defense League. Um, so with that said, um, thanks for the opportunity and look forward to my um, colleagues' comments. Uh, great, uh, thank you. We had a long discussion yesterday about the size of the IT army and it'll be interesting to see if efforts to formalize that affect, uh, affect the actual estimates and they all seem to be largely made up. So um, we had trouble settling on a number and ended up with a range. Um, Amy, let me turn to you if that's okay. Thanks, Erica. Amy, your turn. Thank you very much, Jim, and thank you everyone for having me. I'll start with the standard disclaimer, which is that uh, my presentation, my report, and my views are not my employer, um, but also just introduce a, a summary of the scope. And I, I really step back to take a strategic uh, view of the landscape in this piece, noting first of all that when we look at cyberspace, the NATO line on cyberspace is that cyber is contested at all times. We do not have peace in cyberspace and looking at the war in Ukraine, everything that's happened over you know, the last two years, if not further, um, we see not only how cyber is being used uh, by state or state sponsored actors in Ukraine, but against other states. We've seen certainly uh, an increase in attacks against NATO members um, and in essence, a rising baseline of malicious activity. And there's a number of uh, excellent uh, open source reports now showing about the rising number of attacks against countries all over the world by state sponsored actors. It is no longer exceptional that states are experiencing disruption to their critical infrastructure due to cyber attacks. So this trend that again, uh, all the analysis is showing is not going to disappear. Now, in terms of responding to this threat, and my paper focuses specifically on responding to the state cyber threat, so how, how states are doing this, I explore three themes. And the first of them is really the idea that NATO members and like-minded countries, democratic states really need a comprehensive strategic approach to cyberspace to reject the idea of this rising baseline of activity, that this trend that the new normal means that we should just expect to have an increase in cyber attacks and we should expect this disruption. Now, taking that cohesive approach means absolutely reaffirming the need for norms in cyberspace, um, but also being able to uphold those norms. That means coming together to agree to impose costs. For example, NATO's already uh, stated this and communicates that they will impose costs um, on those who harm them. But being able to do so constantly, being proactive and not being on the back foot. This is hard given an environment where many nations are spending a lot of time firefighting cyber attacks. But the real message here is that if we don't face this now at a strategic level and really take this stance, we not only will remain on the back foot and have more of these instances um, of really quite disruptive cyber attacks, but we're also kind of letting authoritarian states or adversaries kind of shape cyberspace to their advantage. There's a few parts to that. The second part of my piece really explores the importance of resilience, which of course isn't new, it's well recognized that uh, resilience is essential to detecting uh, and responding to malicious cyber activity. But there really is this push that where we know we cannot deter against all spectrum of cyber attacks, we must be able to raise the costs of any compromise. And that means addressing a lot of the systemic uh, challenges that we have around national resilience. So national resilience is a core part of supporting NATO's core tasks. It, Article three very much speaks to the national responsibility uh, of states to enhance their own national resilience and cybersecurity is a huge part of that. Uh, but when we talk about resilience, it really means addressing organizational resistance to change, limited resources, workforce, um, a lot of these themes that are persistent, but really are increasingly urgent because these, these trends aren't changing. 
the focus on resilience and, and call to action really in my report is not just for focusing on your national resilience, but also helping your partners and allies, um, whether that's within a formal alliance structure or just those uh, um, that need help around you. It requires um, practicing as well, ensuring you have crisis management uh, response plans that you are practicing uh, and exercising, that you're also engaging with all the right national stakeholders too, including the private sector which leads me very nicely onto the last piece of analysis that I looked at uh, over the last few years. And of course, uh, that's the increasingly essential role of the private sector when it comes to major cyber incidents or in Ukraine, cyber conflict. And the concern that I'm seeing bubbling up in a few different circles now is, it is incredible that we've been able to mobilize, um, the, the, the private sector has been able to offer so much support, critical support to keeping um, you know, telecommunications and communications online in Ukraine. But there is this concept looking forwards about what does this mean for dependencies? What does this mean for private sector actors who ultimately do, do have to answer to shareholders? Um, what are the kind of mechanisms that we will need to look at a sustainable market solution where in a crisis, people, uh, you know, states can receive aid in a way where it's very clear, one, what the long-term model for aid will look like, but also where roles and responsibilities are very clear. Um, speaking to broader issues about when a private sector actor engages in a conflict, uh, what is their role? Um, how are they involved in terms of liability? Do they become a target? So, so some major strategic questions to ask there. I'll stop now. I think my paper poses a lot of questions to the strategic and policy community, uh, which we might touch on in the questions and answers. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Amy. Uh, I hope we can come back to some of those issues, and I hope we can also come back to the proxy question that uh, Erica raised. Um, so I hope we have time at the end, but we'll see. Let me now ask uh, Melanie if she could talk about her paper. It has probably the most energetic title of all the papers, From Script Kitties to Cyber, Script Kitties to Cyber Warriors. So, uh, <laughs> Melanie, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Jim, and to CSIS and the NCSC for inviting me uh, to be part of this and to my colleagues. It's been a really interesting journey. And apologies in advance for the uh, very, very strained voice. So my comments might be a little shorter than I would have anticipated. But I just really jumped straight off uh, from what we've uh, just heard. and thinking about where my interest came as like everybody are I turned to looking at the cyber sort of effects of uh, Ukraine conflict and for myself it was very much beginning to watch this balance of the private actors of the tech companies and begin to think about what has now been termed the most effective cyber defense in history of thinking about who those actors were, and given that these were a conglomeration of private actors that materially tipped the balance of power in this war. They materially helped move um, and interfere with Russia's cyber ambition. And when that goes with a very writ large sort of sense of where Russia sees cyber operations as not just their network operations, but also the information sphere, and how did uh, they do it and really what questions did this pose for the system and also what was the basis for their decision making in which uh, they came to it so this was a program work that we began to look at we held some um, round tables with representatives of platforms and infrastructure to try and get the heart of what not only what this meant in this particular context but very much going forward uh, in the future of thinking about what does this mean as uh, tech companies and non-state cyber defendants uh, being put onto the front line of defense and to the extent that they're prepared for it. And really this is driven very much by thinking of the overall um, information architecture, the communication systems now becoming with increasingly diversified but consolidated at the same time. So with tech companies now managing from the subsea cables all the way to the satellite infrastructure with platforms and hardware in, in between. And that means that this is an expanded surface area on which they're contributing towards defense of and where their actions within it in relation to any given country is going to have a material effect. And it's really, and also thinking about not only 
and we tend to think of the big platforms and but also thinking where that affected the backbone uh, of the internet. So companies uh, like Lumen, like Cogent, that very quickly exited out of Russia, the bid sanctions regime, and what from a balance of power conception that actually did, and what did government not get right in that picture in the sense of if they exit very quickly, who's going to fill the gap? Who's going to be the providers of information inside Russia? So everything became very binary very quickly. And that's not necessarily in a long term basis, uh, you know, thinking out where uh, we want the balance of power to sit and what the trade offs might be to perhaps keeping companies in place and allowing the sanctions regime uh, to allow companies to operate that because it's in conception of a wider goal but they are as just said sometimes operating in relation to their shareholders also identifying the audience costs that they were facing with not just shareholders but consumers and consumer expectations of how uh, companies were going to act in the context of the conflict so once we put these private actors um, into the mix we also get Another set of challenges that we think of the layers behind it is some of the smaller companies behind these actors, particularly in uh, the cyber realm and thinking about bug bounty platforms and areas where um, we have small companies that were receiving information about vulnerabilities and then directly passing those to government, to Ukrainian government. And the extent that that then becomes enabling of uh, the conflict and to the extent that then going to the question that we just raised before about what liability does that give them? Does that make them a party to conflict? Does that make them then a legitimate uh, target for retaliation? Again, what does this do to the question of uh, the international system? So one of the sort of areas of the, where we then move to and in my paper that to begin to uh, think about is whilst the work was critical, whilst it's been crucial in really supporting Ukraine's endeavor in this context, it came at a cost and it came at a cost that uh, for those companies where sometimes they acted and had to withdraw quickly, which caused a destabilization that was not uh, optimal or sustainable on a long-term basis for thinking about how actors can uh, intervene in conflict. So examples of that were thinking about how uh, the calls, you know, the exit on uh, from Russia and from the concept of provision of the free, open and interoperable internet that we all stand by as a basic right uh, for people universally, where we have private companies then withdrawing from that and really thinking about whether uh, our normative conception and beliefs of uh, provision of the open internet. And some companies tried to find a more nuanced position. So companies like Cloudflare trying to go in and say, well, we'll provide VPN access, but we will try and keep some way in there that gets around the sanctions uh, challenges. So the question really comes to where do we get coherence in the complexity? Where do companies go to to find uh, this space? And how do we enable that uh, for them? And where, you know, where does the responsibility now lie if the actual communications infrastructure becomes the key part of the balance of power in a conflict and the, the, the sense that the security of that and the provision of that is going to uh, tip in one way or another. And so, folks, you see, <laughs> so we have to really think about these crises are not fading. And this is in this context of Russia and Ukraine, where we go to in the paper thinking about it's about as clear as it will get, even though it has um, its complexity. Uh, we've seen cases like Sudan, uh, obviously a lot more challenging civil conflict, a lot more challenging Myanmar, Ethiopia. Uh, are tech companies and the way that they entered into this conflict 
often with statements about not the decision making that they've been through to come uh, to get to why they're intervening, but statements about moral feeling. And moral feeling is, you know, one's not saying that they shouldn't have moral feeling. That's one of the things that often accused of not having, but the sense that this the international system and the information infrastructure and cyber defense requires a little bit more clarity and transparency on how intervention is going to work that's slightly greater than an individual CEO's or a particular board sense of moral feeling at that time. So how are they going to balance their engagement? And this comes also at a time where increasingly some tech companies, we are going through um, contraction where they're closing some of their international offices, closing offices like um, Twitter's like uh, close close its only African office. So think about are they prepared to address these global challenges? Are they prepared to thinking about their role uh, in it and how will they uh, fully address other issues such as a crisis inducing potential of things like generative AI uh, systems and how these are newer technologies uh, are going to be leveraged in there. So it's really thinking about on one level, what are the mechanisms these companies need to put in place? Do they need new ESG frameworks? How do they need to be represented? Should they seek to embed a tech geopolitics experts within their boards, within their decision-making in the conversations we had? A lot of them said it fell to the lawyers, lawyers who are ill-placed to think about geopolitical decision-making. This isn't just a plug for tech companies to hire more political scientists, although that might be a, a good step forward, but to really think about who are the civil society organizations they can work with to provide that nuanced picture. Where do they have that conversation to make sure that their approaches are coherent? One of the tensions that we explored was tech companies said they were interested in having discussions between each other and how they should their actions work together. But the fear of this looks like big tech collusion uh, sort of draws them away from that. So where is the right forum to have that conversation? How does the international com community then rethink our interaction to make sure that actually providing the support for companies to balance their actions with the principles and norms of the liberal and democratic world order. So, and thinking of where this sits with the future of the internet and actually sort of energizing that beyond just the statement on the future of the internet. So, and this will obviously become, you know, accelerated and amplified the more that we see um, interconnected and intelligent weaponry that relies on that stable and resilient and secure communications infrastructure, who is able to provide that is going to materially in the long term be the decider who has the balance of power in the war. And if that's private actors and we've put them on the front line, then we need to think about uh, how we're working with that um, more coherently and really with a better long term vision. So that's where it's at, and I look forward to uh, sort of exploring any of it uh, in the questions with my colleagues. Thanks, Melanie. Uh, Julia, you're our last author to speak, so I'm glad that you could make it. Please, uh, please go ahead. Thanks, Jim, and thanks, everybody. It's a pleasure to work on this with you. So in my paper, I explored the lessons that other states can learn from the conflict so far uh, with respect to cyber defense. Um, and while it's obviously not a good idea to copy and paste Ukrainian cyber defense so far, there are like really specific conditions, for example, um, like the pre-existing gray zone conflict and Ukraine's resulting resilience um, and knowledge of Russian cyber attacks that are perhaps unique. Uh, there are aspects of Ukraine cyber defense uh, that other states should consider while they think um, about how to bolster their own. Um, and so there are a number of lessons that I covered in the paper, but over the next few minutes, I'd like to briefly highlight three of them. 
Uh, so the first is uh, deep collaboration with allied governments. Uh, the second is an advantage in the digital infrastructure. And third, and perhaps my driest point, apologies, is the importance of comprehensive cyber strategies <laughs> to provide the framework for a whole of nation cyber defense. Um, so firstly, the deep relations with state allies um, began way before the 22 invasion, and this converted, as we all saw, into like strong cyber defense um, partnerships throughout the conflict so far. Um, and so I think they most of them started just after the 2014 cyber attack. Ukraine partners with the UK, US, EU um, to like mobilize resources um, to bolster their cyber defenses, included bilateral cyber dialogues to share approaches on organizing cybersecurity structures, um, strengthening cyber incident response procedures, which is something that Amy mentioned earlier, cyber capacity development assistance, um, and even conducting defensive cyber operations. Um, so in the months leading up to the invasion, um, experts from US Cyber Command were sitting side by side with the Ukrainian Cyber Command um, conducting defensive operations to increase the resilience. Uh, and during this uh, invasion, the support continued you know, with intelligence briefings on Russian cyber operations, identifying and procuring hardware and software to support network defense, and also rapid response teams were sent out to help with threat detection and mitigation. Um, and the learning is also two way, right? So uh, Ukrainian cyber forces are perhaps the most, some of the most battle hardened, um, as has been described before. Um, in the world and with uh, Ukraine joining NATO, CCD, COE in March, that's a really good thing for the Alliance because they'll be able to learn from uh, the Ukrainian cyber defense um, in a way and get insights that maybe they haven't previously been exposed to. So secondly, um, my points around the private sector, and I think this complements um, what Amy and Melanie have already said around um, for sustainable market solutions and the roles and responsibilities of private sector. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about the importance of the digital infrastructure of the con of the country um, in terms of the levels of influence of whatever like state cares, uh, its relationships with the providers of the digital infrastructure and the potential access for reinforcements. And so like as with many other, and this doesn't apply to all countries, um, but with many countries, a majority of digital infrastructure, uh, like in Ukraine, is owned and operated by the private sector. And Ukrainian example, as, men, as my colleagues have already mentioned, uh, demonstrate like what is possible when there is an alignment of interests between a country at war and commercial technology companies with the resources at the disposal and the interest in one side's victory, directly or indirectly. And so, you know, private sector have also provided cyber threat intel, satellite connectivity, relocating important data, to name a few things. Um, and they've also coordinated together to form a cyber defense assistance collaborative for Ukraine, where they leverage their pre-existing relationships with the Ukrainian government to, to figure out where they could help and coordinate their activity between the private sector. And obviously, um, they're not driven by altruism. Um, and it has been recognized by many governments at the private sector um, that they need to work with the private sector to bolster cyber defenses. So that's not really new. Um, but I think what is important to consider when we're thinking about cyber defense in any kind of future conflict um, is the interest of the various private sector actors to step up and support your interests. Because as we can see in the Ukrainian instance, it has dramatically enhanced their cyber defense capabilities um, and also enhanced its global appeal. Um, my final point is around uh, cyber strategies uh, that need to include all relevant parties inside and outside of the government um, and also centralized government cyber defenses. So more than two thirds of countries now have some, fort of, some form of cyber security strategy at varying levels of comprehensiveness um, and the most effective cyber defense strategies are integrated across government. So including my own military operations and intelligence gathering and the commercial side of things um, and also um, as in like the Department of Commerce, um, as well as the private sector. And in Ukraine's case, it was this 2016 adoption of the National Cybersecurity Strategy, which really recognized the importance of a holistic approach to cybersecurity, not only across government, but also with partners outside. And this was a clear step in the consolidation of the whole of nation cyber capabilities and the ability, the ability to um, move them together when needed. Um, and so, you know, and as we can see, I think they've released an updated one recently. Um, they need to be continuously updated and responsive to the situation on the ground.
So for the three lessons I mentioned previously, um, clearly two of them are more within, I think, a government's control than the other. States can deepen relations with allies and private sector and implement comprehensive cyber strategies right now. Um, and, you know, there is a lot of effort to control elements of the tech stack. We can see it with all the reshoring, friendshoring efforts, rip and replace by some states. Um, but I would say that compared to the other two, there's a little bit of limited control over any future allegiance between states and the providers of the digital infrastructure that could be important to any kind of hypothetical future conflict. So I'm going to stop my remarks there and look forward to the rest of the session. Great. Thank you, Julia. I think that last point uh, is exceptionally important. But now um, let me, before we go into the discussion among all of us, let me ask Paul for some closing remarks. That's fine, Jim. Thank you very much. And uh, sorry, I was a bit uh, bit late in joining. So um, uh, good afternoon. So yes, my name is Paul Chichester and I'm Director of Operations at the UK's National Cyber Security Centre, which is part of GCHQ, UK's Intelligence, Security and Cyber Agency. Um, so I'm here, I'm thrilled to be sort of representing the NCSC today at the launch of this CSIS report. And again, thanks to Jim, Julia, Erica and Melanie for their support and uh, to the paper and the insightful contributions uh, today as well. Um, for those that don't know, sort of the NCSC um, was created in 2016 in the UK, and it was really about um, trying to bring all the different elements of cybersecurity together into one place to try and uh, get a more coherent uh, and comprehensive response to uh, cyber operations and, and sort of cyber activity by our adversaries. And sort of reflecting a little bit, um, our first um, sort of foray, if you like, actually within a few months was WannaCry. And, and actually sort of that togetherness um, really uh, sort of paid dividend. And I kind of reflect sort of Ukraine's response here. And again, actually how their sort of comprehensive but very joined up and integrated response was again at the heart of their resilience. Um, Jim, you sort of talk at the, in the forward about um, uh, ultimately, you know, most systems are vulnerable and, and you know, most uh, software has vulnerabilities in them and, and you know, most uh, systems are completely secure. And that's absolutely true. And from that, again, you know, that might lead you to thinking the adversary is omnipotent and can, you know, never, never lose. I think sort of from my perspective, I think we've learned a huge amount. We've brought some of those points out in this. The defender does get a vote. I think that's the sort of key thing for, for me in all of this, that we can kind of see uh, through this, that the defender does get a vote. But actually there's a sort of so what to that. And I think the so what is, Perhaps it's not as easy as it's looked over the last few months. And I sort of reflect, you know, what was the alchemy, if you like, that brought us to this point to be able to say that resilience is absolutely showing through. And sort of reflecting on sort of the, the, the you know, what should we as defenders, as nation states, as enterprises be taking away from that? And I think there are key elements that uh, sort of shine through, and it is that coherent, it's that camaraderie, it's that sort of bringing together and operating at pace um, sort of together. So I think one of my takeaways from uh, what we've learned so far is there are sort of some key lessons that we can learn that are perhaps at a more meta level than, than some of the obvious things we, we've already talked about. Um, what is the essence of what we've learned from, uh, from the conflict? Um, I think also um, sort of looking uh, at what we've learned, there's something about match fit. We've talked about that, you know, uh, Ukraine was, was hugely sort of, uh, you know, practiced at this. From a Western point of view, how do we get match fit? And one of my responsibilities in the UK is actually about being responsible for national cyber exercising. Um, and I think there's something there for all of us about actually in the absence of a you know, persistent, constant attacker who is dis disrupting us all the time, and that could be, you know, where the Ukrainians saw themselves, how can we replicate that? And how can we all replicate that to actually sort of defend ourselves um, in, in the future? Um, I think my sort of, um, my final sort of thought and reflection um, is that perhaps, um, uh, perhaps there's a bit of pessimism that I might sort of bring into this as well, and that we're, um, we're reflecting that this has been a hugely successful uh, sort of series of operations and defense of Ukraine, but we're only seeing half of the story. We're seeing that there hasn't been any effect. We're seeing that there hasn't been any impact and sort of disruption 
But actually, I think what I know from sort of a, being a professional in this business, and I'm sure others will know, is that um, you know, cyber disruption is only half of cyber operations. And in fact, actually, cyber espionage and in using cyber operations for intelligence to support a broader multi-domain conflict is equally, if perhaps not, not even more important. And so we should be a little bit cautious, uh, I think, at the moment about judging just how effective uh, Russia has been in that from their perspective, um, uh, they may uh, you know, be uh, you know, being successful in other ways that we can't see. Uh, and I think that's a lesson that we're going to have to sort of learn into the future and just re reflect on that. And we don't get to see their critical success criteria. Um, so, you know, their view of success and ours may, may prove to be different in the future. So I think, again, just um, reflecting on that, that there is still a lot more we've got to learn and a lot more we've got to uh, keep uh, defending in the future. So, you know, again, overall, thank you so much to uh, the authors of the report. Uh, it's a, a sort of really important uh, part of the NCSE's work at the moment. We've, in the last year, we brought uh, a number of groups together and we're really keen to be doing more of this kind of sponsorship uh, in, in the sort of coming months and years, uh, really about, again, perhaps a little bit like Ukraine has done, crowdsourcing uh, the problem and actually bringing a much, much more diverse set of voices into what can be uh, often a far too technical domain. So thanks to everybody uh, and thanks to CSIS as well. Thank you. Great, thank you, Paul. And I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you took the time to join us. Um, there is a lot to go over in this conversation and uh, we have uh, not enough time to get, do everything, but let me talk about some of the themes that struck me and we will give everyone a chance to speak at the end. The first is the emphasis on political effect. And to Paul's point, there's political effect uh, in Western countries and there's political effect for the Russians. So in the information campaign, uh, maybe in the West, the Russians aren't doing so well, but in the rest of the world, they're doing okay. You know? And so one, one thing we knew from the Cold War is when the Russians temporarily opened their archives, uh, what they thought, to Paul's point, what they thought they were doing and what we thought they were doing were very different. And they had a uh, more, um, more they put more value on their operations, perhaps wrongly. Um, we talked about what is strategic and strategic effect. And this is something I've been wrestling with uh, a lot uh, because it's, I say strategic a lot, it's even on our name. What does it actually mean? I hope we can talk about that. Uh, someone raised the digital infrastructure, I think it was Melanie, and how it affects the balance of power. And um, weirdly enough, I was reading, don't ask why, I was reading a, a book by uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski from 1997, where he said, and I hate it when people see stuff decades before it even occurs to you. He said, look, communications, information technology, these are the new tools of power, right? And so that's one of the things I think is in all of your essays and we'll have time to talk about that. Uh, finally, cyber strategies um, in the US, the recent one is really good. If you haven't looked at it, I encourage you to look at it. Many of its predecessors were collections of platitudes. And in fact, some of us had even created cyber bingo. So to see how many times you could say the, the word, but. Um, thinking about what a cyber strategy would look like, uh, it's, it's another one of the themes that permeates all the essays. When NCSC asked us to look at this, they said, focus on defense, defense as redefined by Ukraine. And what do other countries learn from this? So maybe I'll start with that question. And this is an open discussion. Please, everyone chime in. Um, what did you learn from Ukraine? What do you expect to change? Uh, we've all made the point that it's it's a great example, but the conditions are different and the lessons may not transfer easily or perfectly to other countries. So what would you say would be the, the things that you would draw from, and this is in the essays, um, what would you draw from Ukraine that Britain, the US, our NATO allies, Japan uh, might need to do as they rethink their cyber strategies in light of the conflict. Um, I'll call on people if there's no volunteers. Uh, Amy, why don't I start with you? Because you were looking down and so that maybe. I think there's so much you can say. I'm just gonna take one small snippet and it's about giving and receiving assistance. Um, so we saw 
I mean, of course, since 2014, the amount of activity that's gone to bolstering Ukrainians' resistance, which I think the consensus is, has, has been very useful, um, has helped their defense and, and their general national resilience posture immensely, but also the importance of the ability to receive assistance quickly in a crisis. That's something that applies to Ukraine very obviously, but can apply to any state that's suffering from something. And it's got conversations thinking, as we've discussed, how to do that with the private sector, how to you know, very quickly spin up a, a mechanism, but also all those things we need to think about beforehand, the liabilities, the sustainability, the model in which you do it, but also from other states too. Um, so what's the best way to think about crisis incident response and assistance mechanisms? Uh, I can say NATO, for example, at the moment is looking at a mechanism for delivering virtual cyber assistance and in doing so not delivering that just at the time of attack but everything else you have to do beforehand which which are the similar themes for the private sector making sure you have um live you know arrangements in place to protect those that come in to help um making sure you have those agreements set up so that you're that you're actually prepared before the incident happens to know you have that support there so this this huge area around um assistance for me is very important and i'll hand over to the others for everything else go ahead erica yeah, no, I actually, um, this isn't something I talk about in my, um, in my essay, but, um, just reflecting on, on Amy's comments, um, in terms of assistance, I think that, um, when like drawing lessons from this conflict, one of the challenges is that, um, there are multiple potential causes or explanations of sort of generally successful Ukrainian cyber defense and resilience. Although I take take Paul's point that we don't necessarily know how Russia is defining its own metrics. And so maybe what we see as success on a defensive side, you know, uh, Russia may have different, um, a different interpretation, but um, there are lots of players who are willing to sort of claim credit for success, right? Whether it's prior um, uh, collaboration with Ukrainian cyber defenders, whether it's Ukraine's decision to move some of its infrastructure out of the country, um, uh, it just prior to the conflict, whether it's private sector actors, uh, which a lot of my colleagues have talked about in their essays, um, whether it's sort of cyber command, U.S. cyber commands hunt forward operations, right? So there are lots of different potential contributors, or whether it's Russian incompetence or just decision not to um, apply the full weight of its cyber capabilities. And so I think um, we have to be careful not to um, harp on the most sort of convenient um, explanation of success and really uh, to the extent that we can do some real careful analysis about what what have been um you know the the true weight of these different contributions right because otherwise we might um wrong learn the wrong lessons great uh, melanie you wanted to add something yeah i i think it links to that as well but what i could just said is that some, I think we need to also take a step back and look at what are some of the enabling factors that Ukraine had to do under pressure. So even to allow for these types of defenses. So for instance, they had to rapidly change their data governance laws to be able to move their data out of uh, country, to be able to have that level of cyber defense. So as you know, countries are thinking about their digitalization agenda, digital ID and so forth, and how that links up with things like their cyber strategy to really think about that these ripple effects of where uh, that need to be thought out that will enable the cyber defenses that we haven't yet really thought about. I think Ukraine provides some really good lessons in. Uh, similarly, with how they've recently had to think about formalizing the IT army into, you know, where the cyber command, where the risks of having private sort of activists as a, if you want, cyber militia army and where that needs to be formalized to be able to protect them as uh, actors in the Canadian conflict and where that sits legally. So I think for a lot of countries, it now begins to um, add another dimension into thinking of more holistically of what cyber defense and cyber strategy uh, needs to look like uh, as we move forward. Great. Julia, Paul, did you want to add anything? Paul, please. Thanks, Jim. Um, so I think, I mean, probably sort of building on quite a few of those points, really. I mean, and, you know, I said earlier something about being match fit. And I think that certainly, you know, preparation in, in our businesses is absolutely vital. 
Um, I think the thing we've taken away from that is perhaps the, the scale that we prepare for probably isn't adequate. Um, you know, we do national exercising, but we kind of tend to think of those things as you know, a one major disruption rather than a kind of concurrent effect and, you know, sort of things to get. And I think that's one of our takeaways is how as a nation do you respond at scale persistently, continuously, day after day after day? Um, and, you know, that's one of the things we worry about a lot is, you know, the longevity of incidents. And, and I think, you know, I mean, amazing credit to Ukrainian uh, friends to, to have sustained and withheld the sort of, you know, upheld that, that resilience all the way through. We talk about resilience a lot, resilience of those responding to these events as well. And your people, I think, is, is key to this. Um, so thinking about, you know, those individuals doing it. Um, touching a bit on, I think, sort of Melanie's point about um, policies and things, information flows. I think one of the things that, you know, as a nation, we all, you know, nations all know um, is that, we, you know, we're never as good as we could be in sharing intelligence. And in events like this, actually, you know, Ukraine was almost drowning under help. And, you know, and people saying, you know, I've seen this, I've seen that. You know, the ability to both triage that, but share at pace and scale across a nation, be it across intelligence, security, private sector, public sector. I think, again, we say, we, you know, we say this is a team sport. Um, you know, my lesson would be build those partnerships now. Don't wait until a crisis to then think of the, you know, the 10 people you really want to work with in a crisis. Um, sort of think about that, you know, early. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, that, that, that sort of general summing that up, I think it is about, you know, that team sport, preparing as a team sport and probably just being more thoughtful about the scale uh, and the longevity of a conflict in the cyber domain. I don't think any of us really prepare for that and, and plan for it quite enough yet. Okay, Julia, you don't have to talk, but if you want to, I've got another question. It's up to you. And I have just a quick comment to stem. So like, basically, if we can't necessarily depend on the providers of digital infrastructure in any future conflict um, to be aligned with our other state's interests, then I think that one of the things that states should take away when they're building their cyber cap uh, defense capabilities is like run tabletop exercises or cyber simulations where they have varying levels of um, partnership with uh, whoever controls the digital infrastructure in their country. I think like kind of playing through those scenarios and what additional resources would be needed or like, I don't know what could happen. I'm just making it up. Um, <laughs> I think that that's an important important thing to think through. Great. So um, this, uh, this collection of essays, which are great, uh, focused on defense. So I'm going to ask you a question that doesn't focus on defense. It's, it's one I've been thinking about. If you're in a potential attack, if you're one of our opponents, what did you learn from Ukraine? What would you do differently? And I'll tell you off the top of my head, I hope I don't steal your thunder. Um, you have to link it to uh, actual operations in a, in a much more timely sense. I mean, one thing I saw was that the Russians, very active, but not well-coordinated. Um, you need to think of a combined arms approach. And we've talked about this before, a cyber attack and a missile might be more fun than, uh, than either one individually. And, and finally, you need to think about the information battle. The Russians did okay on that, you know, and what did our opponents learn from them? Um, there's the audience on the other side, but there's also a global audience that is useful to capture. But when you think about, I want you to not think of defenders now, Paul, this might be hard for you. It might be not. Don't think as defenders. Now you're, let's pick a country at random, China. What did you learn uh, in terms of if I'm going to do a cyber, if I'm going to start a conventional conflict, how, have I, how do I change my cyber operations as a result? I don't know who wants to go first. Paul, you're nodding, so why don't we pick on you and then we'll... Well, so, yeah, I mean, I sort of, you know, I suppose having a background in in sort of, you know, the sort of full spectrum of cyber operations from, you know, so, you know, uh, uh, you know what can what can any of us learn from, from a sort of offensive point of view? I think you touch for me, on you know, sort of instinctively, you, you sort of touch on that point of um, uh, integration. And actually, one of the things that we all, we, you know, from our point of view, I don't think we were necessarily surprised at, you know, how... Russia integrated um, cyber operations into the conflict. We may we may have reflected that it wasn't as effective as we had thought, but then you could argue that actually it was the response that sort of calibrated that. Um, uh, but I think that sort of you know I think there was a, a sort of feeling beforehand that you know cyber operations were almost it was almost showing off. You know states would do what they you know, anything they could rather than actually integrating it. And I think 
you know we saw actually russia being very thoughtful in how they were trying to use those operations be it through trying to generate a cognitive effect uh, at a nation at a national level or, or whatever so um i think more coordination more agility when things don't go well mm. you know i think there's very often there can be an optimism bias uh on our, our you know uh, from from an offensive point of view and maybe you know the rhetoric over the years builds people up to think hey you know right you know i'm on the offense side you know this is easy um and actually it turns out it's not and so if i was sort of you know thinking about from a, an offensive point of view i'd uh, i'd try and sort of put that optimism bias away uh, and think about just actually what could go wrong here and actually i think more from a, a sort of longer term point of view um how do you integrate cyber operations into a long term campaign i mean again i think you know sort of touching on that sort of um you know we we exercise for small things if you like similarly i think on the offensive side we think about integrating cyber operations into um an operation not a campaign and i think if cyber operations integrated into a campaign is again probably something that um you know a lesson for all is that actually what would you do uh, over an 18 month two year three year campaign and how would you use your cyber operations and actually would you you know in terms of sequencing um the one thing that's probably obvious finally as well is that you know actually a lot of these effects are used once and if 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 i've spent two years gaining access into a network be it an energy energy network or a telecommunications network when's the strategic best point to use that capability as a kind of fire once so again really thinking about campaign integration would be the other thing i I'd, i'd be thinking about that that's it no let me before i turn to the others let me say that the idea of campaigning uh is now sort of central to a lot of the discussion uh here and that the idea, the sort of onesie twosie approach that we've seen in the past doesn't really have strategic effect um the other point i was laughing when you said agility uh no one has ever accused the us of having an agile decision making process and i that might be a challenge but let me let me turn to the others i don't know amy do you want to touch this one i think my really quick point here would be just to link it to almost a defender's argument about resilience which is in summary that so much of it is still around the basics you can still succeed by exploiting the basics um you don't you know need to invest everything in in highly sophisticated of course there's a, there's a place for that but what we see from the defender side is there's so much work in general to do to raise resilience across any nation um some more than us but, but there's so much there, there's so much vulnerability and of course broader trend cybersecurity 101 we're relying more and more on digital infrastructure so um that has implications for the attacker too that's very well known for them so it's my very quick point on that that it's still about the basics which is still why we will fight for resilience building measures all the time unfortunately true i mean for those of us who've been laboring in this for a while you feel like sometimes you haven't made as much progress as you might have hoped uh anyone else hold up your hand if you want to talk uh erica go ahead yeah just real quick i think you know thinking from the attacker side um to your question about china i think that um at least based on the data we have publicly about russian preparation there clearly was you know preparing the environment in cyberspace for for quite some time uh, leading up to the conflict and so if i were china thinking about maybe a taiwan street you know taiwan situation um i'd be preparing now right um and um and, and the other thing too is thinking about uh, cyber as a shaping tool and initial phases of a conventional campaign i i you know the viasat attack was you know russia wasn't able to capitalize uh on the uh operational success of that but it is some you know uh, proof of concept of, of like using cyber as a shaping tool if you can you know to Paul's point effectively integrate your cyber and your uh conventional um elements of your campaign and so um I'm not necessarily sure that the lesson learned would be um let's you know let's just forget about you know about planning for cyber as part of a potential conventional scenario but you know reinforce the significant investment you'll have to make in prior planning and preparation and getting access and um and and, and really um improving um integration especially in the initial phases where i think it's most likely to be effective so yeah that's all great we'll have melanie and then julia and then we'll wrap up so melanie uh, if you want to go ahead <laughs> 
Yeah, I think it just sprinkles on that when what uh, with Paul said as well, sort of, you know, more capability, more vulnerability, and that the more that you integrate uh, that in and then where, and we forget the kind of hardware questions so that we know that sort of where the potential blowback is, which is always where the challenge is on this uh, element, but the more that we're having this sort of whether it's drone warfare or whether it's the sort of communication to infrastructure reliant phase, it's how will you know any attacker manage the being able to ensure the fight that any attack is not going to give you that blowback that's going to prevent you being able to use your communication infrastructure, you know, informed devices if you want as part of your campaign so that and I think that's going to be the sort of big question we know we saw Russian soldiers suddenly using their mobile phones because they couldn't use their secure system and how that opened up vulnerability so I think as from you know attacker and defender point of view I think that's going to be really the heart of the question we're going to have to uncover yeah I think another theme that we didn't get time to cover is the uh, integration or the merger of uh, cyber with electronic warfare, uh, which probably will be one of the factors shaping future conflict. But Julia, you get almost the last word. Thank you. I think um, like one of the things that might strike um, the CCP as they're watching this is uh, the strength of Ukrainian allies, um, the kind of number of well-resourced, highly experienced cyber defenders that came to Ukraine's aid, and then maybe thinking, in a reverse scenario, like who do they have to call on? Like, I don't think they would, I'm not sure uh, whether they'd have this a similar levels of resource um, from partners and expertise and in intel sharing um, as Ukraine has. Great, well, um, let me say that the report is now live on the CSIS website. Uh, you should be able to get it through the webpage. Um, we have not had enough time to cover all the topics we could have covered. And so I apologize. But uh, let me thank uh, Julia, Erica, Amy, Melanie, and Paul uh, for joining us today on what I hope is the start of a longer discussion as we learn more and as we see how things continue to progress, both in Ukraine, but also in NATO. So with that, thank you for joining us. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone. We are off air. Great show. Well, that was fun. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. We'll we'll send the numbers. It usually takes a day or so for the the full because we put it on YouTube and so people watch it. Yes, the live stream, the initial numbers, we had a 416 views with 120, 112 peak viewers at once. Um, and now that it's there, it's archived. Feel free to share it if you'd like. It's available. And those numbers will just keep on adding up throughout time. So thank right. you all. Thanks a lot. Talk to you later.